Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon from wherever you're logging in. Um, just one reminder that we're going to be uploading this webinar to CCAST along with the other webinars that we have, and you can find a post webinar summary in the Grassland Community of Practice public folder. I just posted those links to the chat. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion hosted by CCAST, the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox. My name is Ariel and I'm CCAST's Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator based out of the University of Arizona in Tucson. For those of you who are new to CCAST, CCAST supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars like this one, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species, drought and climate adaptation, and more. Today, we'll be hearing from Stephanie Dorries about the recovery of the endangered Sonoran pronghorn. Stephanie is the Sonoran pronghorn recovery coordinator and wildlife biologist at Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. She has more than 13 years of experience working with Sonoran pronghorn. As an employee of the Arizona Game and Fish Department, she worked uh, as, at, at the Sonoran pronghorn captive breeding pens and then studied the efficacy of Sonoran pronghorn recovery efforts. Her doctoral research at the University of Arizona focuses on the effects of human activity on Sonoran pronghorn. One final reminder before I pass it on to Stephanie um, that this discussion will be followed by a Q&A session and we encourage you to write any questions directly into the chat and we'll do our best to get to those questions at the end of the webinar. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. Pass it to you, Stephanie. Great, thank you, Ariel. And you should now be seeing the first slide. Has everybody seen that first slide, Ariel? Yeah, it looks great, thank you. Great, thanks so much. Well, as Ariel said, my name is Stephanie Dorries, and I'm really excited for this opportunity to talk about our efforts to recover the endangered Sonoran pronghorn. I think it's worth starting out by remembering why we are interested in conserving pronghorn in the first place. They are the fastest land mammal native to North America and involved, they started to evolve more than 10 million years ago when the Great Plains looked a lot more like the Serengeti. There were numerous species of antelope-like creatures such as pronghorn roaming the Great Plains at the time, but as well as the American cheetah. But of those species, the only one still living today is the, is the pronghorn. So they're the only living species of family antelope capridae. They're named for the bucks ranching horns. You can see the buck in the center there in the picture. There are some forward pointing prongs about halfway up the shaft of the horn, and that's what gives the species its name. They prefer flat open country like the grassland here or the Sonoran Desert around us. And there are four recognized subspecies today. The American and Mexican subspecies are both much more common in grasslands, while the peninsular and Sonoran pronghorn are the, the desert pronghorn. The Sonoran pronghorn is actually the smallest and pal palest of these four subspecies, and their mating and fawning season is shifted to occur earlier in the year, corresponding with the desert's bimodal rainfall patterns. They've been listed as endangered in the United States since 1967 and in Mexico since 1994. Here you can see the three endangered populations of Sonoran pronghorn. You see one, the Cabeza population in Southwest Arizona, and two in Mexico, the Pinacate population in red, and the Kitova population in brown in Northwest Sonora. They, they occupy approximately 8% of the estimated historic range, which you can see shaded in the background, extending almost to Interstate 10 in Arizona, a little bit over into California, and then as far south as Hermosillo in Sonora, Mexico. The initial approach to Sonoran pronghorn recovery focused on habitat protection. Not a, not a lot was known about Sonoran pronghorn biology, but population size was estimated to be between 19, uh, in, between 1924 and 1984, it was estimated to be about 50 to 150 in the United States. 
and about 250 to more than 1,000 in Mexico. But it's worth keeping in mind that a lot of these estimates were based on uh, ground surveys or surveys that don't necessarily meet some of the standards that we have today, which I'll get into in several minutes. So we really were starting from the ground up trying to learn about the basic ecology, the basic life history of Sonoran pronghorn. This started with preliminary studies from 1968 to 1972, but we really started to learn more about Sonoran pronghorn with the first coloring effort in 1983. And you can get an idea by this picture here of why it took so long for us to first collar pronghorn. And that's because they're very, very difficult to capture. On top of that, Sonoran pronghorn are very, very sensitive to capture myopathy. So you have to, so learning how to trap and capture Sonoran pronghorn without killing any was, it was definitely, definitely a challenge, especially since they were on the endangered species list. Fortunately, biologists and contractors were able to collar pronghorn in uh, 1983 and, from, and start to monitor them both on the ground by trying to track them with uh, antenna as well as by aircraft. And so the result of this was learning a lot more about the ecology of snoring pronghorn. We were able to start to understand their habitat preferences. So we started to learn that the previous assumption was that Sonoran pronghorn really preferred these valley bottoms. And it really wasn't recognized until these coloring efforts and, these, and this monitoring that pronghorn actually preferred the bajada or the gentle slopes off of the mountain ranges. And this has really important implications for recovery actions. Now, back in the 50s and 60s, wildlife biologists built waters for Sonoran pronghorn in the valley bottoms, but never documented any, documented any use which led them to, to conclude that, you know, Sonoran pronghorns seem to eschew water. They'll turn up their nose at water. They don't really need to drink and they can just get all of their water needs from vegetation, ma making them rather different from uh, the American subspecies. But once we figured out that, well, pronghorn don't spend their, they only spend the wettest of winters in those valley bottoms. In the summers, they're mainly up on the bajadas, they're eating a lot of chain fruit choya for its water content. So once we understood that aspect of their ecology, we were able to start to get various ideas about potential recovery actions or things that we could do to help support the Sonoran pronghorn and minimize their risk of extinction. And all, even more importantly, uh, get them delisted from the endangered species list. Species list. So with that, uh, the monitoring of radio colored pronghorn, wildlife biologists were also able to devise a way to accurately estimate the abundance of Sonoran pronghorn and just figure out how many there are out there. It's something that is, it's one of the basic problems of ecology, just how hard it is to accurately count the things that are out there, whether it's rodents or pronghorn. They're rather difficult to get an accurate estimate and figure out exactly how many are there which makes it a little bit harder to track our progress and uh, as, as far as recovery goes. But fortunately, wildlife biologists were able to use radio colored pronghorn and fly range-wide surveys on north-south transects, transects spaced about half a mile apart. They would record the number of pronghorns seen. They would use radio collars to figure out what groups they missed. And from all of this effort, they were able to determine that they're really good at seeing large groups of pronghorn, but they miss small groups of pronghorn, especially pronghorn in complex habitat, relatively often. They use this information to develop a sighting probability model to get the first more accurate estimates of Sonoran pronghorn abundance. So we've been conducting biennial range-wide surveys in the US since 1992 and in Mexico since 2000. Here you can see the results of those efforts, minus the confidence intervals, which are so kind of big. The U.S. is, uh, you can see the U.S. population by the black circles and black line, the Kitovac population with the blue triangles and blue line, and the Pinacate population with the red squares and red line. And I'd like to point out two important things in this figure. The first is 2002. After a year of severe drought, the population in the United States and in Mexico 
crashed to the lowest on record for both the Pinacate and the US and the second lowest on record in Ketobak. In the United States, biologists think we were only about three weeks away from the entire population going extinct. We had 21 individuals in the United States, about 25 in the Pinacate, and only 260 in the Ketovac subunit. Since then, numerous recovery actions have been implemented, particularly in the United States. You can see how that's evident in the relatively little variation in the population estimates for the United States. It's not following those very sharp inclines and declines that you see, particularly in the Ketovac subunit, the Ketovac unit, but also in the Pinacate unit. We think that is partly due to not only releasing pronghorn from captive breeding, the captive breeding pens, but also some of the habitat modifications that I'll talk about to begin with. So this sense then that it's really changed the dynamic of our approach to recovery. And I, so we can best describe our current approach to recovering to non pronghorn as being founded on four, uh, four pillars. The first being captive breeding, the second being habitat modifications, the third being monitoring. And then all of this, of course, would not be possible without the partnerships that we've been able to build and maintain over the past several decades. Well, I'll start with captive breeding. The goals of captive breeding are to better understand snoring pronghorn ecology, to augment the existing populations, and then also to establish new population under Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act. I want to describe this a little bit more and hopefully clarify this with this map that you see here. The yellow hatched area is the Cabeza Management Unit, the original endangered population in the United States. The orange hatched unit is the Pinacate population, and that red, red hatched unit is the Kitovac population. Those black hash marks indicate the Arizona Reintroduction Management Unit. That was established in 2011 when we published what we call the 10J rule that allows us to establish non-essential experimental populations in the United States. We have within that Arizona reintroduction management unit, we have two distinct populations or what we call subunits. We have the COFA subunit to the north between Interstate 8 and Interstate 10 and the Sauceda subunit, which is south of Interstate 8, but east of State Route 85. You might also notice on the left side of that image, a tan hatched area, which is what we hope will soon be the California Reintroduction Management Unit. We're working with various partners and groups in California and other, uh, other members of the Fish and Wildlife Service to try to establish a, a third non-essential experimental population in California, but that has to be done through a, a new rule uh, and which we hope to be able to finalize within the next couple of years. Now for context, the first captive breeding pen was established on the Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge. It's approximately located where that white star is in Child's Valley. That was, the pen was built in 2003 and the first pronghorn were brought there in 2004. Between 2004 and 2006, we brought in pronghorn both from the wild in the US and the wild in Mexico, specifically that larger Kitovac population in the South. Here you see a view of the northwest corner, the, excuse me, the northeast corner of the pen. We have a, an, an internal game fence with the, uh, covered with shade cloth and then as well as two external electric fences to help keep predators out. This is a view that's looking slightly to the South of that northeast corner. And you can really notice in this photo that white line. That allows us that to pump water from a nearby well to both irrigate native forage in the pen, as well as to provide pronghorn with supplemental water. Because as, we, as was gleaned by following radio-colored pronghorn, we learned that pronghorn actually do drink water. It was documented uh, uh, pronghorn drinking from bomb craters was actually documented by biologists before there were any pronghorn specific waters out there on the range. But having them in the pen allowed us to learn more that yes, pronghorn will regularly and readily drink from, uh, from waters as you can see here. But with the restricting of Sonoran pronghorn to this area, so for, uh, for context, the pen is a 
is about a one square mile in size, about 640 hectares. And it's divided in half by a fence that runs from east to west into a north herd and the south herd. And that allows us to maximize the space and uh, have two herds so we can increase genetic diversity and maximize productivity within the captive breeding pen. So within the first year or so of the pen being established, uh, we learned that the, even despite the native forage being irrigated in the pen, that was just not enough to support the pronghorn and provide them with the nutrition they need. So we started to provide them with supplemental forage in the form of alfalfa hay. And fortunately that worked really well. And, and although their consumption significantly decreases when it's green, as you can see in this photo, they'll definitely consume that, uh, they'll definitely consume the hay that's available. And so that, that has helped us to maintain the health of adults as well as the health of fawns. Because we had such success with pronghorn in the Cabeza captive breeding pen, in 2011, we were able to take pronghorn from the Cabeza pen and fly them via helicopter to a pen in, on Kofa National Wildlife Refuge. And you can, that's the, the approximate location of the pen is that white star that you can see here on this map. The habitat is fairly similar, but because of the, you know, but we didn't need the pen on Kofa to be quite as large. So we just built a pen that's only 320 hectares or about a half mile by one mile in size. Now, raising pronghorn in a pen is fortunately had turned out to be relatively easy because we were able to, once we figured out to, uh, that we needed to provide them with the supplemental forage and uh, you know, maintain the waters, but releasing them into the wild is a whole other matter. Originally, uh, we had biologists set up blinds near the feed stations where the pronghorn would readily feed. And we would set the feeders so that they were only 20 yards from the blinds. Biologists would dart the pronghorn, where the darts would contain anesthesia, and that would cause the pronghorn to, uh, uh, cause the pronghorn to, well, that would knock the pronghorn out, and then we would have to go into the pen. We would handle the pronghorn and uh, you know, administer, uh, provide it with the appropriate aid, and then transport them by a vehicle to a holding pen. You can see from here, we had a lot to learn about safely transporting Sonoran pronghorn, and fortunately, we've learned those lessons since uh, 2008 when this photo was taken. The anesthetized pronghorn would be given a reversal in a recovery pen. And then we would open the door to the pen and either release it directly into the wild or preferably into a holding pen where we would keep the pronghorn for anywhere from two to three weeks to minimize the effects of capture myopathy. This method works great when you only have maybe half a dozen pronghorn to release into the wild, but when you have, you know, when you have two dozen, this method no longer works very well. So in 2009, the refuge built what are called BOMAs or corral traps in the captive breeding pen, one set in each herd. Each BOMA is about 50 feet in diameter and there are doors in between these three concentric circles that you see here. We would provide supplemental forage inside these corral traps and then the pronghorn would go in and out to consume their forage. We'd spend about um, two months uh, prior to captures getting the pronghorn more and more comfortable and essentially luring them into that westernmost boma, the one on the left that you see here, when that with the, where that door was completely shut. So all we had to do was close this door, external door, that black, uh, that black cloth that you see in this image, so we could trap the pronghorn inside. From there, biologists would go in and separate out two to three pronghorns so we could handle them at a time. And then we would transfer them one or two at a time in a helicopter. That was a little bit more effective than transporting them by truck, but still it would take a very long time and was just not efficient either time-wise or cost-wise to move pronghorn by a helicopter. So fortunately, we had biologists think about using a climate controlled trailer. This is a special air conditioned trailer with, uh, with padded walls and uh, that we now use to transport up to a dozen pronghorn at one time 
to holding pens where we'll keep the pronghorn for two to three weeks. And here you can see some of the pronghorn, very, very comfortable. They've been given anti-anxiety agents so, so that they can make this journey with minimal uh, risk to themselves. And they often take a little bit of encouragement to get out. And then we'll keep them in a holding pen anywhere from nine to 22 acres in size. Uh, before I will keep them in that holding pen for anywhere from two to three weeks, sometimes a little longer if necessary, before releasing them out into the wild. And that can help reduce the, like I said, the, those negative effects of capture myopathy and give them the opportunity to hear from any abrasions or scrapes that they may, may have sustained during the capture operation itself. Since we started releasing pronghorn in 2006, a total of 394 have been released. Survival has ranged between 43.5% and 100% with the mean survival of 69.4%. And what I mean by survival is the survival from the survival through the end of September of their first year of release. Most pronghorn are released in December or January. And so survival would be through the September of that year. Because we want to account for the fact that the that summer is probably the most difficult time period as far as survival would go for a Sonoran pronghorn. And so if they're able to make it through that first September, then that's, that's essentially how we, we evaluate survival and success of, uh, of our release that particular year. So releasing all of these pronghorn into the wild doesn't necessarily do us all that much if we're not also concerned about the quality of the habitat. And that's where habitat modifications come in. These essentially, we, we predominantly focused on providing on supplemental water and supplemental forage, as well as uh, developing some forage enhancement plots. This all started with biologists hauling water out to Rubbermaid containers and buckets. Here you can see some pronghorn at the, the Charlie Bell for at the Charlie Bell forage enhancement plot or Charlie Bell drinker before it was a forage plot or a permanent in-ground drinker was, was built. Now, once we established that pronghorns were reusing this site, we worked with uh, we worked with um, construct uh, we worked with Desert Wildlife Unlimited in California, and they helped us design a pronghorn friendly drinker because they had designed some good waters for sheep. But pronghorn will not really stick their head too far into something because they're so reliant upon their visual acuity and need to see their need to see the uh, surrounding environment. So we were able to develop this model where we have an in a shallow in-ground trough that is fed by water contained in these underground storage containers. Water flows into these underground storage containers by very small collecting points built into relatively small drainages that can easily fill within one rainfall, of course, depending on the, the size, uh, depending on the amount of rain. Forage enhancement plots were built by laying down yellow mine pipe from a nearby well, gluing everything together, and then preparing and then having valves for both sprinkler irrigation, as you see here, and also flood irrigation. Here you can see an example of what regular flood irrigation can do to an area when the rest of the range often looks as brown as this. And fortunately, we've been able to document pronghorn using these areas, including fawns. Over the years, we have in total built two active forage plots that are, we're able to maintain today. And then we have five five sites at which we provide both water and supplemental forage in the form of alfalfa hay. We have three inactive forage enhancement plots. I would like to point out that one of our forage enhancement plots uh, is, uh, we also provide a feed at that plot. And then we have 11 waters that are available for Sonoran Prompton to use. Of course, whenever we put something like, whenever we, whenever we try to improve the habitat, improve the habitat, it's important that we monitor these areas so that we can implement adaptive management. We do this by 
monitoring radio collared pronghorn, predominantly released from, the, released from the captive breeding pens, but also those that we might be able to capture in the wild. We also monitor use of the drinkers and feed stations with motion activated cameras. We implement non-invasive genetic sampling on an annual basis and then conduct the biennial annual aerial surveys. We'll start by talking about radio collars. So radio collars allow us to, uh, have in the, originally allowed us to identify locations for recovery actions. When the wild pronghorn were first collared in the 1980s and the 1990s, their locations were tracked, like I said, on the ground and by a fixed wing aircraft. And that was, the, and that gave wildlife biologists the idea is that uh, potential locations for installing waters and uh, feed stations as well. We were also to estimate the approximate home range size of Sonoran pronghorn, about 517 kilometers square, or square, which is a lot larger than the American, their American counterparts, and understand the habitat preferences, as I was mentioning before. Another really important thing that these radio collars have allowed us to do was to track fawn recruitment. That allowed us to learn that fawn recruitment is uh, positively correlated with winter rainfall. So the more winter rainfall we get, the more fawns we have, which isn't too surprising. But it also, we also learned that the shorter the time period between the last winter rain and the first summer rain, the higher fawn recruitment that we have as well. We did not find that the amount of summer rainfall was that important for fawn recruitment, which is also important for us to uh, understand. The radio collars also allow us to investigate mortalities and understand the pre uh, predominant sources of mortality for Sonoran pronghorn, particularly those released from the captive breeding pen. That can allows us to evaluate our success, uh, success for survival. Well, for example, uh, one of the in one of the early years that we were transporting pronghorn using anti-anxiety agents, we learned that the dosage for one particular drug was not very successful. So we instead have, we instead stuck with using Haldol or Haloperidol instead of uh, the alternative. And with some location data, we can try to understand how pronghorn use of the range has potentially changed over time. And here you can see locations of waters and waters and feed stations. You can see how those were placed based on past historic data prior to implementation of recovery efforts, those black dots that you see here. And then you can see the more recent dots in yellow, green, and red. Now, the results of this study did not indicate any significant change over time, but that's probably in part due to the placement of the, the, rec the recovery actions based on the historic data. We also use motion activated cameras to help mo uh, monitor and assess the efficacy of recovery or recovery actions. We're able to document when pronghorn start using drinkers or feed stations, which can help us determine when we should start hauling hay to a very, uh, any particular site. We can get an idea about how many pronghorn are using each site, which is very useful for conducting non-invasive genetic fecal sampling of Sonoran pronghorn. This map here on the left shows a study that has, uh, shows the sampling sites for a study that, uh, the, that we've been conducting with the, through a partnership with biologists at the University of Idaho since 2012. We'll use MARC recapture using the genetic identification of a given fecal sample to try to estimate the abundance and the survival of pronghorn using these sites. The red sites are waters where we provide the supplemental and forage that I've mentioned earlier, while the blue teardrop sites are waters that are sampled only once in order to collect these fecal samples. The, the black triangles indicate sites that are sampled opportunistically because we know based on our monitoring efforts that about 30% of the population probably is not using these drinkers or feed stations. So we'll collect a sample uh, at uh, multiple, at uh, one week intervals at the multi-session sites, those red squares, and we'll use the amount, number of times that an individual is redetected or the number of, number of times that individual occurs within those sampling periods to help us estimate abundance, as I mentioned earlier. So those black circles you see are the abundance estimates based on the non-invasive genetic fecal sampling conducted. 
while the red stars are, are estimates from the biennial surveys. And it's really exciting to see that as we conducted this sampling over time, we're actually getting more and more accurate because we've been able to use more complex models that allow us to incorporate the fact that some prong, that there are years where, where individual pronghorn will not be visiting any drinkers or feed stations. So the idea of herd groups where pronghorn mainly stay in particular valleys was, uh, was completely blown out of the water, again, by tracking radio collared pronghorn, uh, specifically radio collared wild pronghorn, and seeing how they'll, they'll readily move from one valley to another uh, in, in uh, you know, visiting the full extent of their range, uh, re you know, regardless of um, you know, their, their past knowledge. So probably following habitat conditions. So we're excited to see that we can actually get closer to potentially estimating abundance with fecal sampling to provide, get us a little bit more information than some of the aerial surveys can provide. Now, identifying individuals across years allows us to estimate survival from one year to the next. And this allows us to do, we can, we've also found that we can distinguish adult pronghorn from fawns by the size of the fecal pellets. So we're able to get an estimate for the survival of fawns that are, you know, approximately, um, you know, four, four-ish months of age through their first year. And this apparent survival in the graphs have been uh, adjusted to account for that. You see a lot more variability in the survival of fawns, about similar survival of uh, male and female fawns, but a lot more variability. And then uh, it's you know, ranging between 0.4 and 0.8%. For adults, actually, the, um, you'll see that survival is a little bit higher, ranging between, uh, you know, between about 0.7 and uh, 0.9. And is again is relatively similar for males and females, maybe a little bit higher in females. Our future plans for non-invasive genetic fecal sampling is to conduct is is to use this sampling opportunity to conduct genetic monitoring and assess the genetic diversity of the population. So we're working with partners uh, and to get to a point where we can start doing that on a an annual basis to help meet some of our recovery goals. Again, the other thing that we do is the biennial aerial surveys. This allows us to assess the efficacy of recovery actions by calculating the population uh, growth rate. So past researchers, uh, we've worked with past researchers to learn that the biennial precipitation and biennial growth rate are positively correlated. And those blue dots that you see on the screen are the biennial growth rates from prior to implementation of any recovery efforts. And that's also the line and the prediction interval that you see uh, on the graph. Those black triangles are the biennial population growth rates and the, and the precipitation rates since implementation of recovery efforts. So you can see that some that the pattern is becoming a lot more linear. So with our recovery efforts, we're reducing the importance of biennial precipitation on the population growth rate, but still not eliminating it entirely. The other thing that biennial aerial surveys allow us to do is monitor our progress towards our downlisting criteria by tracking how close we are getting to abundance targets. The abundance targets were established through some pop population viability analyses that uh, essentially we, that, is, that essentially define how we can minimize the risk of extinction. So for the Cabeza Management Unit in green, that abundance target is 225. Most recent estimate is 232. So that's, that first number for all of those populations is going to be those population abundance targets that we have listed in our recovery plan. Well, that second number is going to be the most recent estimate. So the... In the Pinacate, our the most recent estimate was 102 compared to our target of 150, and Ketovac uh, was 100 was 449 compared to the estimate of 450. The for all of our non-essential experimental populations, those target abundances have been set at 150. So you can tell that we're getting fairly close to that 
uh, that target for the COFA non-essential experimental population in blue, which was established in 2013. But the Sauceda subunit, which we established just in 2015, that area has a little bit farther to go, in part because we've been experiencing more mountain lion predation than we generally uh, have documented in other units. This graph here gets you a little bit better idea about how we're tracking towards this abundance target. And it's only really been since 2015 that we've even come close to exceeding that. And uh, with good rainfall and continued uh, implementation of our recovery, as we're, hope, we're hoping to stay above the, that target abundance of 225, but we're a little bit concerned by the, the drought the past two years, as you can see by that decline in 2021. This, uh, this graph of the population estimates in Mexico, we have Kitovac again in blue and Penicate in black. That red line indicating the, the Kitovac target abundance and the orange dotted line indicating the Pinacate abundance target. You can see that that Kitovac population unit has a great potential for supporting Sonoran pronghorn, but there's just a high amount of variability because of the because of the lack of additional support and uh, habitat modifications in that area. The Pinacate popula uh, population has been getting close to that estimate, but it still remains below. Now, all of this progress and all of this success that we've seen, particularly with implementation of recovery efforts, really hinges on solid partnerships. And this is, these logos only show a fraction of the number of individuals who've been involved, but we also attribute our success uh, to the Sonoran Pronghorn Recovery Team. We meet uh, about three times a year, and it's about three times a year, and it's a relatively open meeting where um, really interested individuals can join and uh, you know, listen to what everything that's going on. And even though the number of people who are technically on the recovery team is generally smaller than those who attend the meeting. Well, here you can see a group of individuals who came out to help with the Snore and Pronghorn captures one year. With, we have veterinarians, individuals from, uh, from state, federal, state and federal agencies, and uh, we're all you know, working, working hard to try to ensure that we can effectively release Sonoran pronghorn out into the wild. So with that, I would just like to open up, uh, the, uh, open up the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Aplaus. So great, great presentation. Um, and I think a really hopeful one. Uh, I'm really happy that we were able to showcase the successes of the Sonoran Prong One recovery effort. Um, yeah, at this point, um, if anybody has any questions, I encourage you to uh, unmute, just say it or put it in the chat if you're, if you're more comfortable with that. Um, Stephanie, if you want to stop sharing your screen um, and folks want to open up their video, we can see each other and really encourage more of a, a horizontal discussion here. There's a lot of people on the call today who have experience um, supporting in one way or another pronghorn. So uh, although Stephanie is obviously a, a foremost expert in this manner, uh, matter, there are a lot of people with experience here that questions can be, can be uh, directed to. Maybe to kick things off, we received a question from um, Jacob Eberspatcher. Jacob, are you on the call with us today? It's like maybe maybe not. But the question that Jacob uh, Jacob asked that that maybe Stephanie you can you can address is um, at the landscape scale of restoration, so at thousands of acres or more. What are the most important and or cost-effective ecological modifications that can be implemented to support Sonoran pronghorn? Great, that's definitely a, a big question. I'd say some of the best tools at a landscape scale are, in, in, at least in some ways, the most cost-effective is, is trying, to, trying to reduce the further and future impacts and 
uh, prevent further habitat fragmentation and degradation. So one of the one of our the current challenges that we're having uh, with some of our non-essential experimental populations is um, solar development. Uh, occupying to like, oh, it's we want to build solar on the really flat desert pavement that nothing likes. You're like, well, actually, Sonoran and Pronghorn really like those uh, those desert pavement areas because after rainfall, you have really great forb growth, and Pronghorn will spend a lot of time in those. Uh, in those areas, it's some of their favorite places, uh, particularly after rainfall. But uh, one of the benefits of establishing non-essential experimental populations is that regulatory relief that's um, that's really provided. Uh, it's a really important tool for uh, recovery that uh, we've been able to take advantage of. But it, one of the benefits and one of the things that makes that more pal palatable to partners and uh, you know from private landowners to agencies is the reduced, um, is that the presence of pronghorn, except on National Wildlife Refuge, really doesn't have a lot of teeth. So um, you, if a solar development were occurring within the endangered population in an important area, we, like that would, the status of the pronghorn would have, would have really, really uh, high significance, but we don't have that same level of significance with the non-essential experimental populations. So, um, you know, doing what we can to partner with various agencies to try to reduce additional fragmentation and additional habitat loss uh, is really important. Uh, so like maintaining connect that kind of falls under the umbrella of maintaining connectivity. Uh, but I, uh, you know, also like to add that given for Sonoran pronghorn, probably one of the, the best things we can do is to provide supplemental water. Uh, it's that's relatively cost effective if you're able to get a permanent system in ground, if you're able to get a large enough system in particular, uh, that will require minimal management over time. And you know, when you consider that you know, within, the, within the 2 million acres approximately of where the endangered population roams, there's one permanent source of water and it's generally surrounded by vegetation. So they're not, we've never really documented any pronghorn utilizing Keto Bikito on Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument. And part probably because it's just not really in the best habitat for them. And it's right along the border where there's a lot of uh, human disturbance. So having, uh, having those additional water sources is really important. You know, pronghorn aren't necessarily, aside from Keto Bak, at least in the United States, pronghorn aren't necessarily where their habitat is best. They're, they survived where they were left alone. So we have pronghorn, you think about that uh, historic habitat map, pronghorn extending all the way north to Interstate 10. The Gila River used to flow, Colorado River used to flow fairly readily. So you know, pronghorn were able to utilize uh, some of these water sources, but that's not really an option for them anymore. Let's see. I think you're muted, Ariel. Thank you, I was. Um, there's another question that came in from Tice. Tice, are you, are you with us? The question that Tice asked was, if there is coordination with Mexico to maintain genetic diversity. Yes, so that uh, coordinate we, uh, Right now, we're hoping to translocate six Sonoran pronghorn from the either the Cabeza or the Copa captive breeding pen. And we tried to do that last year, but we're, we were stalled at the border for too long due to a lapse in one of the permits. Uh, so we renewed all of our permits this year, and we're, hope, we're hoping that habitat conditions will allow us to translocate pronghorn in the in this this December to help facilitate that uh, that movement. Um, we. We have part of that non-invasive genetic sampling has included sampling on the Pinacate in Mexico, which uh, has allowed us to get an idea about some of that population structure, which is different from that in the United States. The genetic structure in the US, at least in the endangered population, is uh, it breaks down into two distinct groups, which could potentially be related to the captive breeding pen or the wild snoring pronghorn and the wild pronghorn from Kidovac that were brought to establish the pen in the first place. So we're, we're starting to work on developing a more regular genetic monitoring plan and to try to uh, collect 
uh, some fecal samples from Mexico to, to answer some of these questions. So we're, we're in the process of, of working on that, but, but we're trying to facilitate movement. Uh, our, you know, Melanie Culver uh, recommended that if we don't really, as long as animals are reproducing, we don't necessarily need to move a lot of individuals every year in order to, uh, in order to ensure that they don't, in order to like maintain, um, or in order to ensure that the genetic uh, differences aren't too great. So, um, you know, we're, but we're getting to a point where we're starting to discuss that. It's very difficult to move pronghorn across the border <laughs> due to a lot of uh, various requirements. So we're, uh, you know, we're, we're happy that we can do that. We can pay Mexico back as a big thank you uh, for allowing us to bring pronghorn into the U.S. to start the captive breeding pen. But um, so we're, we're working on trying to evaluate a little that a little bit more effectively in the, into the future, as well as expanding that non-invasive genetic fecal sampling to our non-essential experimental populations so we can monitor that as well. And uh, some geneticists with, uh, with California Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as UCLA, are working to um, map the pronghorn genome so that we can use small uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms and look at pronghorn genetics, both in the US and Mexico, and that could help us even determine parentage. That's really cool. I like that collaboration with geneticists in, in, in California. It seems like a really helpful aspect of, of the of the sort of larger uh, connection between all the different subpopulations. It's really cool. Definitely, definitely. Um, Brian asked a question as well. Brian, are you still with us? If you are, encourage you to unmute and ask your question if you feel comfortable. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, everybody. And hello, Stephanie. Thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if there, you mentioned briefly uh, pronghorn around the border. I just wondered if there's been a noticeable impact on pronghorn movement uh, close to the border or pronghorn use of areas close to the border with the construction work that's gone on there. Yeah, it's been difficult to monitor pronghorn movement near the border because it's we haven't had radio collars in that vicinity for a while. So we've, you know, we've since collars have mainly been on released pronghorn, and we're it, for us to release pronghorn that close to the border, um, where we'd probably see the most noticeable impacts. Um, that's, you know, we we haven't had pronghorn in those areas for a while, and that sometimes that's just how pronghorn distribute themselves after they're released. Um, so we haven't necessarily been able to um, we haven't necessarily been able to figure that out. But one of the one of the um, issues that we're trying we've been trying to deal with was that um, we did have some pronghorn probably from the United States uh, just because the prior to the build the prior, prior to the construction of the border wall highway two in Mexico which runs fairly close to the border for a portion of the, the our boundary with the, with the for a portion of the international border border where there are pronghorn at least um, we did have uh, pronghorn probably cross into Mexico that are kind of uh, essentially uh, trapped in this area between Highway 2 and the U.S.-Mexico border. And so we've been working with Border Patrol on trying to see if we can get pronghorn to cross back into the, into the United States. Um, uh, but it's, it's been difficult to try to figure out if we could also try to encourage them to cross Highway 2 because it is a relatively formidable barrier to pronghorn. There aren't any overpasses, which pronghorn prefer to underpasses. So that's, I think those, those seven pronghorn are kind of some, something that we've been working on and trying to, you know, build in our partnerships to facilitate that. We did have a buck released, oh, I think it was in 2008, who, or in, in, 2000, in 2007 or 2008, who actually ended up crossing Highway 2 several times uh, and ended up living very happily on the Pinacate, but um, you know, we've, so far we, we haven't been able to document that in these pronghorn. So I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah, thanks. Um, if I could follow up real quick, I'm wondering mm -hmm. how important uh, people think, or if there's been discussion about how important uh, the, it is to the Pinacate population to be able to move in and out of that area. Uh, well, so the, the big issue with that is Mexico Highway 2. And so we, we think we were, 
you know, although the, the border wall essentially that does reduce habitat and really preclude any movement whatsoever, we mainly documented pronghorn from the US using that area when it was really during a really green winter, for example, and didn't necessarily think it was the, um, we didn't necessarily think it was like the biggest, um, it's, it's not the, the biggest loss to snoring prong recovery. It's not going to, it's not going to jeopardize the recovery of snoring pronghorn in the U.S. And you know, we, you know, I've, I've followed pronghorn tracks in Mexico, go right up to that highway, but not cross. And, and that's something that we've also seen from collared pronghorn in Mexico. You know, the locations would get right up against that highway. So we, we essentially think that we were in this position already prior mm -hmm. to the construction of the border wall because of how, uh, because of how frequently Highway 2 is trafficked and because of the fencing along the highway. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those questions, Brian. Uh, I think that connectivity is a really important part of this equation. And obviously the highway and the border wall are both really big impediments to, to movement. Um, there are three other questions that we have. I think we'll have time for, for those, um, but we'll, we'll see. We've got five minutes left. Um, our, uh, Stephanie, are you able to stay on a little bit longer to answer those questions? I am, yes. Okay, great. So if folks can stay with us as well, even past the past the end of the the, the webinar, we'll we'll keep we'll get to those questions, and we'll also send the recording and a post webinar summary as well. Um, so Bo Nicole Boulier has asked a question as well. Bo, are you still with us? Looks like maybe Bo. Oh, yes, but no camera or mic. Great. I'll ask the question on your behalf. Um, the question is, has there been a noticeable impact on, no, wait, wait a second. I just repeated the same question there. Bo's question was, are we trying to sustain Arizona and Mexico populations before reintroducing to California and Baja California? So there are currently no plans to reintroduce pronghorn to Baja California because uh, analysis of museum specimens indicate that was most likely the peninsularis, the peninsular pronghorn. Um, you know, it's we're, we want our eggs to be in as many baskets as possible. So uh, we're so sustaining the Mexico populations from the Cabeza captive breeding pen would be a little bit difficult. There has been talk about maybe doing captive uh, a captive breeding pen in Mexico, but we haven't. Uh, we haven't pursued that. Uh, we haven't like we haven't pursued that very vigorously. Um, we do uh, try to focus on the Arizona populations and support those populations. Um, you know, right now the the COFA population is on track. Uh, this you know, we could we could support the Sasseta population a little bit as well, but it, it all kind of depends on. It kind of plays into this other. Other question that I might go ahead and address, um, which uh, we can only release pronghorn where the, ha the habitat quality is, is sufficient. So the the number of you know yearling to five year old animals within the captive breeding pen is act is really the determination for the number of pronghorn that we end up releasing into the wild each year, and so. We look at habitat conditions. We look at the number of pronghorn that we need to release. Where, uh, you know, you know, where we need radio collars on the landscape for better monitoring. Uh, for uh, Brian's question, to try to answer those questions a little bit better that we have about how pronghorn are using some areas. Um, so we, we try to generally keep about ten percent of each population collared, but aren't necessarily able to do that, uh, depending on our efforts. So that's those are some of our things that we consider as we, you know, as we, um, you know, determine how to release pronghorn and, um, and where to release them. Thanks, Stephanie. Jamie, does that answer your question? I hope. Do you have any follow-ups? Nope, that pretty much sums it up. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And then Tice asked the question as well that's in the chat there. I don't know if you saw that, Stephanie. Nods, no, great, so. Yeah, so the, that's a really great question, Ty. So you, you noticed that the map showed potential habitat east of the Babuquibri Mountains. And so you had some thoughts about establishing Sonoran rather than Mexicana at Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. That's a, that's a really good question. And that's so, something that we're, um, we're there's you know, a little bit of you know, discussion you know, within you know, some members of the recovery team. That's where we think historically 
you know, pronghorn range, but there's a lot of question about whether that is or is not a historic Sonoran pronghorn habitat. You know, right now, uh, you know, Soren pronghorn might have some genetic adaptations to the desert and some of the dry conditions that um, that might make them better suited there. But again, that's pretty. That's the those areas are are grassland areas that are really distinct from the uh, you know from the Sonoran Desert as well, where you know at least the Cabeza and some of the Kitovac uh, and the habitat in the Kitovac and the Pinacate populations as well. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something that we're, you know, there are a lot of other, there are a lot of other baskets that we can put our eggs in besides, uh, besides looking at Buenos Aires and potentially opening that can of worms. So we're, we're just, we'll focus on, on California and then COPA and Sauceda at this time and other potential release and uh, releases in other places in Mexico, if, if possible, if, if we're able to do any captive breeding or establishing additional populations in Mexico. Great work, Stephanie. So glad to see all this proactive effort to restore this species. We can add, add a couple of cool birds to your area. Well, you should see some of the really cool birds that we've documented at some of our drinkers, from golden eagles to uh, prairie falcons, uh, we did uh, lazuli buntings. So it's, yeah, we, we get some pretty cool bird use of the drinkers as well. Need two birds with one supplemental waterer. Exactly. Great partnerships have one there. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I think I, I got to all the ones that were asked in the chat, but we'll just give a little bit of space here for anybody who has a question that's bubbled up as we've been, been discussing here. Great. I mean, that might that might bring us to a close. Stephanie, do you have any any final thoughts or questions for the group? Or I just appreciate the opportunity and really again want to thank the Sword Common Recovery Team and everybody who so many people have been involved in recovery for for decades, plural, uh, numerous people involved for decades and. So, you know, recognizing that although various agencies have different missions, we're all able to you know, work towards our goal of problem recovery, set some of those differences aside and you know, accept the different missions and recognizing that recovery in Sonoran Pronghorn is not necessarily, is not incompatible with their meeting the goals of their the various missions. So we've just been really fortunate to have, have people who care about pronghorn recovery and are willing to work hard no matter who gets the credit. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you for your presentation. Really great. We're really happy to, again, be able to showcase this effort, really long-term partnership um, with tremendous success. And we want to thank everybody who joined us today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, 